Section three of My First Summer in the Sierra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My First Summer in the Sierra by John Muir. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Section three, June twelve. A slight sprinkle of rain. Large drops, far apart, falling with heavy pat and plash on leaves and stones, and into the mouths of the flowers. Cumuli rising to the eastward. How beautiful their pearly bosses! How well they harmonize with the upswelling rocks beneath them! Mountains of the sky, solid-looking, finely sculptured, their richly variegated topography wonderfully defined. Never before have I seen clouds so substantial-looking in form and texture. Nearly every day toward noon they rise with visible swelling motion, as if new worlds were being created. And how fondly they brood and hover over the gardens and forests, with their cooling shadows and showers, keeping every petal and leaf in glad health and heart. One may fancy the clouds themselves are plants springing up in the sky-fields at the call of the sun, growing in beauty until they reach their prime, scattering rain and hail like berries and seeds, then wilting and dying. The mountain live-oak, common here and a thousand feet or so higher, is like the live-oak of Florida, not only in general appearance, foliage, bark, and wide-branching habit, but in its tough, knotty, unwedgeable wood. Standing alone with plenty of elbow room, the largest trees are about seven to eight feet in diameter near the ground, sixty feet high, and as wide or wider across the head. The leaves are small and undivided, mostly without teeth or wavy edging, though on young shoots some are sharply serrated, both kinds being found on the same tree. The cups of the medium-sized acorns are shallow, thick-walled, and covered with a golden dust of minute hairs. Some of the trees have hardly any main trunk, dividing near the ground into large, wide-spreading limbs, and these, dividing again and again, terminate in long, drooping, cord-like branchlets, many of which reach nearly to the ground, while a dense canopy of short, shining, leafy branchlets form a round head which looks something like a cumulus cloud when the sunshine is pouring over it. A marked plant is the bush poppy, Dendromicon rigidum, found on the hot hillsides near camp, the only woody member of the order I have yet met in all my walks. Its flowers are bright orange-yellow, an inch or two inches wide, fruit pods three or four inches long, slender and curving, Height of bushes about four feet, made up of many slim, straight branches radiating from the root. A companion of the manzanita, and other sun-loving chaparral scrubs. June 13. Another glorious Sierra day, in which one seems to be dissolved and absorbed and sent pulsing onward, we know not where. Life seems neither long nor short and we take no more heed to save time or make haste than do the trees and stars. This is true freedom, a good practical sort of immortality. Yonder rises another white skyland. How sharply the yellow pine spires and the palm-like crowns of the sugar pines are outlined on its smooth white domes! And hark! The grand thunder billows booming, rolling from ridge to ridge, followed by the faithful shower. A good many herbaceous plants come thus far up the mountains from the plains, and are now in flower, two months later than their lowland relatives. Saw a few columbines today. Most of the ferns are in their prime. Rock ferns on the sunny hillsides. Chilanthes, Pelea, Pymnogram, Woodwardia, Aspidium, Woodsier along the stream banks, and the common Pteris aquilina on sandy flats. This last, however common, 
is here making shows of strong, exuberant, abounding beauty to set the botanist wild with admiration. I measured some scarce full grown that are more than seven feet high. Though the commonest and most widely distributed of all the ferns, I might almost say that I never saw it before. The broad-shouldered fronds held high on smooth, stout stalks, growing close together, overleaning and overlapping, make a complete ceiling, beneath which one may walk erect over several acres without being seen, as if beneath a roof. And how soft and lovely the light streaming through this living ceiling, revealing the arching, branching ribs and veins of the fronds, as the framework of countless panes of pale green and yellow plant glass, nicely fitted together. A fairyland, created out of the commonest fern stuff. The smaller animals wander about as if in a tropical forest. I saw the entire flock of sheep vanish at one side of a patch, and reappear a hundred yards further on at the other, their progress betrayed only by the jerking and trembling of the fronds. And, strange to say, very few of the stout woody stalks were broken. I sat a long time beneath the tallest fronds, and never enjoyed anything in the way of a bower of wild leaves more strangely impressive. Only spread a fern frond over a man's head, and worldly cares are cast out, and freedom and beauty and peace come in. The wavering of a pine tree on the top of a mountain, a magic wand in nature's hand, every devout mountaineer knows its power but the marvellous beauty value of what the Scotch call a brecon in a still dell, what poet has sung of this? It would seem impossible that any one, however encrusted with care, could escape the godful influence of these sacred fern forests. Yet this very day I saw a shepherd pass through one of the finest of them without betraying more feeling than his sheep. What do you think of these grand ferns? I asked. Ah, uh, they're only damn big breaks, he replied. Lizards of every temper, style and colour dwell here, seemingly as happy and companionable as the birds and squirrels. Lowly, gentle fellow mortals, enjoying God's sunshine, and doing the best they can in getting a living, I like to watch them at their work and play. They bear acquaintance well and one likes them the better the longer one looks into their beautiful, innocent eyes. They are easily tamed, and one soon learns to love them as they dart about on the hot rocks. Swift as dragonflies, the eye can hardly follow them, but they never make long sustained runs, usually only about ten or twelve feet, then a sudden stop, and as sudden a start again, going all their journeys by quick jerking impulses. These many stops, I find, are necessary as rests, for they are short-winded, and when pursued steadily, are soon out of breath, pant pitifully, and are easily caught. Their bodies are more than half-tail, but these tails are well managed, and never heavily dragged or curved up as if hard to carry. On the contrary, they seem to follow the body lightly of their own will. Some are coloured like the sky bright as bluebirds, others grey like the lichened rocks on which they hunt and bask. Even the horned toad of the plains is a mild, harmless creature, and so are the snake-like species, which glide in curves with true snake motion, while their small, undeveloped limbs drag as useless appendages. One specimen, fourteen inches long, which I observed closely, made no use whatever of its tender sprouting limbs, but glided with all the soft, sly ease and grace of a snake. Here comes a little grey dusty fellow, who seems to know and trust me, running about my feet and looking up cunningly into my face. Carlo is watching, makes a quick pounce on him, for the fun of the thing, I suppose, but Lears has shot away from his paws like an arrow and is safe in the recesses of a clump of chaparral. Gentle saurians, dragons, descendants of an ancient and mighty race, heaven bless you all, and make your virtues known. 
for few of us know as yet that scales may cover fellow creatures as gentle and lovable as feathers, or hair, or cloth. Mastodons and elephants used to live here, no great geological time ago, as shown by their bones, often discovered by miners in washing gold gravel. And bears of at least two species are here now, beside the California lion or panther, and wild cats, wolves, foxes, snakes, scorpions, wasps, tarantulas. But one is almost tempted at times to regard a small, savage black ant as the master existence of this vast mountain world. These fearless, restless, wandering imps, though only about a quarter of an inch long, are fonder of fighting and biting than any beast I know. They attack every living thing around their homes, often without cause as far as I can see. Their bodies are mostly jaws, curved like ice-hooks, and to get work for these weapons seems to be their chief aim and pleasure. Most of their colonies are established in living oaks, somewhat decayed or hollowed, in which they can conveniently build their cells. These are chosen probably because of their strength, as opposed to the attacks of animals and storms. They work both day and night, creep into dark caves, climb the highest trees, wander and hunt through cool ravines as well as on hot unshaded ridges, and extend their highways and byways over everything but water and sky. From the foothills to a mile above the level of the sea, nothing can stir without their knowledge, and alarms are spread in an incredibly short time without any howl or cry that we can hear. I can't understand the need of their ferocious courage. There seems to be no common sense in it. Sometimes, no doubt, they fight in defence of their homes, but they fight anywhere, and always wherever they can find anything to bite. As soon as a vulnerable spot is discovered on man or beast, they stand on their heads and sink their jaws, and though torn limb from limb, they will yet hold on and die biting deeper. When I contemplate this fierce creature, so widely distributed and strongly entrenched, I see that much remains to be done ere the world is brought under the rule of universal peace and love. On my way to camp a few minutes ago, I passed a dead pine nearly ten feet in diameter. It has been enveloped in fire from top to bottom, so that now it looks like a grand black pillar set up as a monument. In this noble shaft a colony of large jet-black ants have established themselves, laboriously cutting tunnels and cells through the wood, where the sound or decayed. The entire trunk seems to have been honeycombed, judging by the size of the talus of gnawed chips like sawdust piled up around its base. They are more intelligent-looking than their small, belligerent, strong-scented brethren, and have better manners, though quick to fight when required. Their towns are carved in fallen trunks, as well as in those left standing, but never in sound living trees, or on the ground. When you happen to sit down to rest, or take notes near a colony, some wandering hunter is sure to find you, and come cautiously forward to discover the nature of the intruder, and what ought to be done. If you are not too near the town, and keep perfectly still, he may run across your feet a few times, over your legs and hands and face, up your trousers, as if taking your measure, and getting comprehensive views. Then go in peace, without raising an alarm. If, however, a tempting spot is offered, or some suspicious movement excites him, a bite follows, and such a bite! I fancy that a bear or wolf bite is not to be compared with it. A quick electric flame of pain flashes along the outraged nerves, and you discover, for the first time, how great is the capacity for sensation you are possessed of. A shriek, a grab for the animal, and a bewildered stare follow this bite of bites, as one comes back to consciousness from sudden eclipse. Fortunately, if careful, one need not be bitten often than once or twice in a lifetime. This wonderful electric species is about three-fourths of an inch long. Bears are fond of them, and tear and gnaw their home logs to pieces, and roughly devour the eggs, larvae, 
parent ants, and the rotten or sound wood of the cells, all in one spicy acid hash. The digger Indians are also fond of the larvae, and even of the perfect ants, so I have been told by old mountaineers. They bite off and reject the head, and eat the tickly acid body with keen relish. Thus are the poor biters bitten, like every other biter, big or little, in the world's great family. There is also a fine, active, intelligent-looking red species, intermediate in size between the above. They dwell in the ground and build large piles of seed husks, leaves, straw, etc., over their nests. Their food seems to be mostly insects and plant leaves, seeds and sap. How many mouths nature has to fill, how many neighbours we have, how little we know about them, and how seldom we get in each other's way. Then to think of the infinite number of smaller fellow mortals, invisibly small, compared with which the smallest ants are as mastodons. June 14. The pool basins below the falls and cascades hereabouts, formed by the heavy down-plunging currents, are kept nicely clean and clear of detritus. The heavier parts of the material, swept over the falls, are heaped up a short distance in front of the basins, in the form of a dam, thus tending, together with erosion, to increase their size. Sudden changes, however, are effected during the spring floods, when the snow is melting and the upper tributaries are roaring loud from bank to brae. Then boulders that have fallen into the channels, and which the ordinary summer and winter currents were unable to move, are suddenly swept forward as by a mighty besom, hurled over the falls into these pools, and piled up in a new dam, together with part of the old one while some of the smaller boulders are carried further downstream, and variously lodged according to size and shape, all seeking rest, where the force of the current is less than the resistance they are able to offer. But the greatest changes made in these relations of fall, pool, and dam are caused not by the ordinary spring floods, but by extraordinary ones that occur at irregular intervals. The testimony of trees growing on flood boulder deposits shows that a century or more has passed since the last master flood came to awaken everything movable to go swirling and dancing on wonderful journeys. These floods may occur during the summer, when heavy thunder showers called cloud bursts fall on wide, steeply inclined stream basins, furrowed by converging channels, which suddenly gather the waters together into the main trunk in booming torrents of enormous transporting power, though short-lived. One of these ancient flood boulders stands firm in the middle of the stream channel, just below the lower edge of the pool dam, at the foot of the fall nearest our camp. It is a nearly cubical mass of granite about eight feet high, plushed with mosses over the top and down the sides to ordinary high-water mark. When I climbed on top of it today and lay down to rest, it seemed the most romantic spot I had yet found. The one big stone with its mossy level top and smooth sides, standing square and firm and solitary, like an altar. The fall in front of it, bathing it lightly with the finest of the spray, just enough to keep its moss cover fresh. The clear green pool beneath, with its foam bells, and its half-circle of lilies leaning forward like a band of admirers, and flowering dogwood and alder trees leaning over all in sun-shifted arches. How soothingly, refreshingly cool it is beneath that leafy, translucent ceiling, and how delightful the water-music, the deep bass tones of the fall, the clashing, ringing spray, an infinite variety of small low tones of the current gliding past the side of the bold island, and glinting against a thousand smaller stones down the ferny channel. All this shut in, every one of these influences acting at short range, as if in a quiet room. The place seemed holy, where one might hope to see God. 
After dark, when the camp was at rest, I groped my way back to the altar boulder and passed the night on it, above the water, beneath the leaves and stars. Everything still more impressive than by day. The fall seemed dimly white, singing nature's old love song with solemn enthusiasm, while the stars, peering through the leaf roof, seemed to join in the white water's song. Precious night! Precious day to abide in me for ever! Thanks be to God for this immortal gift! June 15. Another reviving morning. Down the long mountain slopes the sunbeams pour, gilding the awakening pines, cheering every needle, filling every living thing with joy. Robins are singing in the alder and maple groves the same old song that has cheered and sweetened countless seasons over all of our blessed continent. In this mountain hollow he seems as much at home as in farmers' orchards. Bullock's oriole and the Louisiana tanager are here also, with many warblers and other little mountain troubadours, most of them now busy about their nests. Discovered another magnificent specimen of the gold cup oak, six feet in diameter, a Douglas spruce, seven feet, and a twining lily, strophilerian, with stem eight feet long and sixty rose-coloured flowers. Sugar pine cones are cylindrical, slightly tapered at the end and rounded at the base. Found one today nearly twenty-four inches long and six in diameter, the scales being open. Another specimen, nineteen inches long. The average length of full-grown cones on trees, favourably situated, is nearly eighteen inches. On the lower edge of the belt, at the height of about twenty-five hundred feet above the sea, they are smaller, say a foot to fifteen inches long, and at a height of seven thousand feet or more near the upper limits of its growth in the Yosemite region, they are about the same size. This noble tree is an inexhaustible study and source of pleasure. I never weary of gazing at its grand tassel cones, its perfectly round bowl one hundred feet or more without a limb, the fine purplish colour of its bark, and its magnificent outsweeping, down-curving, feathery arms, forming a crown always bold and striking and exhilarating. In habit and general port it looks somewhat like a palm, but no palm that I have yet seen displays such majesty of form and behaviour, either when poised silent and thoughtful in sunshine, or wide awake, waving in storm winds with every needle quivering. When young it is very straight and regular in form, like most other conifers, but at the age of fifty to one hundred years it begins to acquire individuality, so that no two are alike in their prime or old age. Every tree calls for special admiration. I have been making many sketches, and regret that I cannot draw every needle. It is said to reach a height of three hundred feet, though the tallest I have measured falls short of this stature sixty feet or more. The diameter of the largest near the ground is about ten feet, though I have heard of some twelve feet thick or even fifteen. The diameter is held to a great height, the taper being almost imperceptibly gradual. Its companion, the yellow pine, is almost as large. The long, silvery foliage of the younger specimens forms magnificent cylindrical brushes on the top shoots and the ends of the upturned branches and when the wind sways the needles all one way at a certain angle, every tree becomes a tower of white, quivering sunfire. Well may this shining species be called the silver pine. The needles are sometimes more than a foot long, almost as long as those of the longleaf pine of Florida. But though in size the yellow pine almost equals the sugar pine, and in rugged, enduring strength seems to surpass it, it is far less marked in general habit and expression, with its regular conventional spire and its comparatively small cones clustered stiffly among the needles. Were there no sugar pine, 
then would this be the king of the world's eighty or ninety species, the brightest of the bright, waving, worshipping multitude. Were they mere mechanical sculptures, what noble objects they would still be! How much more throbbing, thrilling, overflowing full of life in every fibre and cell, grand glowing silver rods, the very gods of the plant kingdom, living their sublime century lives in sight of heaven, watched and loved and admired from generation to generation, and how many other radiant resiny sun-trees are here and higher up, Lipocedrus, Douglas spruce, silver fir, sequoia, how rich our inheritance in these blessed mountains, the tree pastures into which our eyes are turned. Now comes the sundown. The west is all a glory of colour, transfiguring everything. Far up the Pilot Peak Ridge the radiant host of trees stand hushed and thoughtful, receiving the sun's good night, as solemn and impressive a leave-taking as if sun and trees were to meet no more. The daylight fades, the colour spell is broken, and the forest breathes free in the night breeze beneath the stars. End of section three.